We have uh, three readings this morning. The first one is from Exodus 15, 1 to 12, selected verses from NASB. After Israel had escaped from slavery in Egypt through the Red Sea, Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea, and the choices of his officers are drowned in the Red Sea. Their deeps cover them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness? Awesome in praises, working wonders. You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. In your loving kindness, you have led the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you have guided them to your holy habitation. The second reading is taken from 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 2 from NASB. For I do not want to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and then in the sea. And the final reading is from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, combined from NSAB and the message. So as though as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, dress in the wardrobe of God picked out for you, compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline, Be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the Master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic, all-purpose garment. Never be without it. This is the word of the Lord. Um, can I just say for people, um, young people who want to do colouring, there are some boxes over there. You can take them back to your seat or sit there and um, do colouring if that would be good. Or the family room is also available if you need to. But um, shall I just pray for you, Simon? So, Father God, just bless this time to us. Um, help us to hear all that you have for us uh, from, through Simon today. We thank you for your word, Lord, and we thank you for Simon. We thank you that you love him and that you speak through him. Father God, open our hearts and our minds to take all this from you today and to take it and share it with those around us. For your glory's sake. Amen. 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 Thank you. And thank you for the reading and the uh, action, the introduction. Yeah. Three readings, they may seem very different, but you just want you, if you can, just lodge them and we'll draw on them as, as, as we go through. You know, some, sometimes I set myself to read the Bible and I, I'll, I'll read a chunk at a time and just go on through and, and keep on. And then sometimes you sit yourself down to read and you just get stopped in your tracks. And this is what happened with what I'm going to share with you um, this morning, this is how, how it occurred. Reading the book of Colossians. So Paul's writing to a church, an ordinary church, just like us, full of ordinary people. And this is Colossians 3, there it is up there, that's good. And this is what he wrote to them. He said, so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved. And that was as far as I got. (laughs) Because it stopped me in my tracks. 
And when you think about it, and you read that to yourself, this isn't written to some super spiritual saint that we might put up on a pedestal. Paul was writing to an ordinary church full of ordinary people. And he said to them, and God says to you, you've been chosen. You're holy. You're beloved. And to be honest, I could sit down at this point and we could just think about that and just let that feed us. The Word of God feeds us. It talks about feeding on the Word. You take it into yourself and let it change you, let it strengthen you, let it energize you, just like food does. And that's what those words do to me. I'd like to just take those words one at a time. We'll, We'll explore them. Hopefully we'll get through them. I didn't manage it this morning, <laughs> but, but, we, but, but God's good. God, God will show us what, 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 what to include and what to leave out. But the first thing is chosen. Not only chosen, as in the sense of hand-picked, that's what came to me, you've been hand-picked, but also hand-made. If you go in your Bible and go right back to the very beginning of it and look at the story of creation, you'll find God created everything, and he did it by doing what? Speaking. He spoke, and there was light. He spoke, and the heavens were made. He spoke, and the animals were made. But not mankind, not us. We're different. And so all this stuff about us being just another animal is rubbish. Sorry, not politically correct, but you know, I'll say how it is. It is not how God made us. God did not speak us into being. He wasn't distant when he made us. He made us with his hands. And it's there in creation, but it's also there personally for you. You're not just some accident that happened remote from God. God was intimately involved in your formation. And if you want to know that, go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah tells us, Jeremiah 1.5, before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I separated you. I consecrated you. I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. And in exactly the same way, God's got this word to speak to you before you were formed in the womb. I knew you. Before you were born, I separated you. I've appointed you to a, what you fill in the blank. And you said, well, I don't know. Well, that's okay. God will show you. If you don't ask him, you, you might go on muddling along for a long time not knowing. But if you ask him, he will show you. And I found Eugene Peterson, uh, who wrote the message, has wrote, written a whole series of fabulous books. And I picked up one from my brother's shop, the, the bookshop in, in town. And I'd, I'd walked in there one day, and I saw this book on the shelf, and he said, well, it's just come in today. And I picked it off the shelf. And in fact, this was just before I got just my diagnosis for cancer in October. And I wrote that book, and that book spoke to me straight away. One thing it said was in there, short-term pain is worth it for long-term peace. And that was the trigger for me to go to the doctor and to actually get the diagnosis. You know, God's at work in the background, and sometimes we don't even know it. There's more going on in our lives than we realize. So we pop to the slide here. Yeah. And the next prompt... (laughs) Go again. Is it not working? Oh, what a shame. <laughs> okay. Some of you might know I do a bit of photography. Okay. And I do photography with, with old cameras and with, with wet film. And I've, I've got this fantastic camera that does really big negatives. And I scan them into the computer and you come up on the screen. There you go. Oh. <laughs> and... When you first look at them, they can look a little bit washed out. 
like the top one. See, the sky, there's no detail in the sky. But on the computer, there's Photoshop, and Photoshop has got two fabulous controls, one called Clarity and one called Dehaze. They remove the fog, <laughs> and they bring out the detail. And the, they're both the same photograph. The bottom one has just had the sliders for Clarity and Dehaze moved. Photoshop hasn't added in anything. It's just shown what's there. <laughs> and when I saw that, and the concept of this, God spoke to me, he said, look, there's more going on in your life than you can see with your eyes. <laughs> Sometimes you just need to remove the fog and just see through. And receive that word. There's, you, you, you can think, I don't know what's happening, I don't know what's happening. But as Dave shared, there's more going on than we can actually physically see with our eyes, and we trust God. Okay, next slide, please. You see, one of the things with Jeremiah is the poor Jeremiah. He didn't have a lot of choice in his life, really. <laughs> All this stuff happened to him. And right from the beginning, God says, I've appointed you. I've set out in your life what you're going to do. And, we, we, uh, and these days, you see, uh, the, the, the thing people come back with, what about my rights? What about my choice? <laughs> I would say, sorry, Jeremiah, but this is how it is. But our greatest fulfillment comes when we line ourselves up with how God intended us to be and our calling in our lives, not when we sort it out for ourselves. We can want to be in control and dictate what happens in our lives. And these days, now, people will set up these things that people can say, well, I've got my bucket list. Don't get me going on, right, I've, I've set the study notes for the groups, and I'm asking you to just think about why having a bucket list might, what it might tell you about your vision of your calling and your purpose here on earth and eternity. Can the two sit together? You can argue about that. <laughs> Our future is in God's hands. But God has worked things. God gave away Jeremiah. God gave his son to the earth. God's nature is to be a giving God. We're made in his image. We function at our optimum when we are giving. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Yeah. Giving is woven into the fabric of existence. This is what uh, Eugene Peterson says. Ooh, back one. <laughs> Again, there we are. Giving's woven into the fabric of existence. If we try and live by getting instead of giving, we're going against the grain. And if we look at society now, and it's always been the case, if you're out for what you can get out of it, everything ends up a mess. But if you live with a sense of generosity, which is how God has designed creation to work, then it's going to work. It's just like trying to go against gravity. If you go against it, you end up with bruised bones and bro um, broken bones and bruises. And that's why there's so many dis distorted, dis misshapen, and crippled lives amongst the world, because people are not living in accordance with the way God has set the world up. They're going against the way it's been designed, and inevitably, it's painful. Okay, let's have a look at the second word. We said chosen, holy. Yeah. How could, immediately, people are going, but I'm not holy. You know, I'm not a saint. Well, sorry, you're not reading your Bible. <laughs> we can think about some of the, the reasons why we might say that that's not the case. And one of the things is the enemy of our faith has done a real job on, on, on language. And he's used language and turned language to deprive us of the truth and beauty and the power of what God has done for us. And so words like holy have become a, a, a derisory thing. You know, you holy Joe, you, you know, you're, you're just holier than thou and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's not seemed to be something to be esteemed. Just like words like sin, heaven, hell, even Jesus Christ. The enemy has worked on these words and messed them up in our language so that they haven't got the power that they should have. 
and we need to reinstate that within ourselves in our understanding and our reading and our conversations with one another. But holy is what God says we are now. And that's why I get grieved when I hear people say, well, we're all sinners, aren't we? Which I've heard in conversations recently. You know what that is? <laughs> no, we're not all sinners. We were. Yeah, I'm not, not arguing about that. We were all sinners. That's, that's how we started off. But that's not what we're like now. It's just not true. It's not what the Bible teaches about our nature when we become Christians, when we become born again. And that's why it grieves me. It grieves me because it demeans and it diminishes what Christ has done for us. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Freedom from what? Freedom from sin. Well, if you've been freed from sin, why are you calling yourself a sinner still? It doesn't add up. You're not a sinner. You're a saint. You're holy, chosen, holy. The gospel's good news, and this is good news. It's not good news to say, well, I could become a Christian, but I'm no different to what I was before. I was a sinner before. I'm still a sinner. What's, what's getting born again done for you? If you're still telling me you're a sinner, then what's happened? Nothing. If you've got saved, you've got saved from being a sinner into being a holy, into becoming the people of God, a priest, and a king in the kingdom of God. A huge transformation has taken place when you got born again, and we forget it. You've been transformed. You've been moved out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You were under death. You're now under life. It's absolutely fantastic. It's wonderful what Jesus has done for us. And the transformation is real. And it has a real impact on our lives unless we don't think it, unless we don't cooperate with it, unless we don't live according to the truth that is there. Have the next slide, please. Thanks. So Andy, uh, I thought I was in trouble last week when Andy started to read the scripture that, that he was going to preach from. Um, because he, he included this verse, but he, he concentrated on, on what followed, which was a great relief to me. Um, but here's this verse. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. If you've become a Christian, something new has been created. Another translation says, if anyone is in Christ, new creation. <laughs> something brand new is there. Something dramatic has happened when you've become a Christian. Old things have passed away, new things have come. The old has gone, the sinner has gone, the holy, kingdom of God person, righteous person, is now joined with Christ. The new has come. You know, we don't come to church to focus on how we mess up, how weak we are, how we constantly fail. Though often our liturgy can make you think that. Sorry to be, I was told in these things you're not supposed to be controversial, but anyway, I'm going to have to let, have to let that one go. Sorry, Andy. <laughs> but we've come to be reminded of the truth of God's Word, to encourage one another, to build one another, one another up. And yes, if we mess up, then of course we confess our sins, and He's faithful and just and forgive us our sins. And Jesus understood that. That's why in the Lord's Prayer, he says, forgive us our sins. But it doesn't come right at the top of the list, does it? Yeah? If that's the most important thing that we've got to do when we come into church is to sort our sins out, then that would be at the top of the prayer list. No, he comes in and he says, it's Father. Yeah? That's the most important thing, that we've come and we've come into the presence of our Father. And then the other things come along. And then part of that is, yes, sort out stuff that you're getting wrong, and he'll help you. But if we're constantly looking at our mistakes, we're going to continue to make them. You know, it's like driving. I'm terrible at this. If, if I see a, 
I like watching birds, okay? And actually, come, as I was coming here, I just have to let you know this. As I was walking across here this morning, I heard this screeching noise, and there were actually two peregrine falcons up on the pylons, just up on the roundabout there. But I'll, anyway, but if I see a bird, I'll look at it. And if I'm driving, that's a terrible thing. <laughs> <laughs> There's a buzzer there. Oh, God. You know, because you go what you're looking at. And if you're constantly looking at your sin, where are you going to go? Yeah? I, I, there's a story, I don't know if it's apocryphal or, or not, but... People who were being trained in, in, in the banks to recognize fake, fake bank notes. Yeah, and you've heard this. And they were given genuine bank notes, and that's all they handled in their training. And they were asked, why don't you give them fake ones? Well, they said, well, if they know what a real one looks like, as soon as they pick up a fake one, they know it's not right. What you're looking at shapes where, where, where you're going. You know, sports people constantly visualize not the mistakes they could make, because that's what they end up doing. They visualize succeeding. We can learn from that in our Christian faith. We focus on the fact that you are chosen, you are holy, you are beloved. If you mess up, confess it, sort it out. But the main thing is you're chosen, you're holy, you're beloved. Amen? Amen. Have the next slide, please. Fix our eyes on Jesus, what he's won for us, freedom from sin. The Old Testament is really, really important. Reading it and understanding it is vital to be powerful in your, in your Christian faith. And this is one of the most fabulous sections for me. The, the story of the Exodus is the story of salvation. And this particular passage is powerful. And it's part of the song, No Longer Slaves to fear, we were singing, I'm going to ask Dave to change it, no longer slaves to sin. Israel was as an, a nation, but they weren't really a nation at the time. There was a group of people that were captive in Egypt, enslaved, being oppressed, been like that for 400 years, called out to God, and God sent Moses to lead them out and deliver them. And they, they, were, they were actually coming out of Egypt, and then all of a sudden, Pharaoh wasn't going to let them go. These people were enslaved. That's what sin does to us. Sin enslaves us. And we find ourselves doing things we know we didn't ought to do and we don't want to do, but we can't stop doing it. That's being enslaved. This is a picture of sin in our lives. Pharaoh and his armies is the power that enslaves. That's what sin does to us. What we've got here is a picture of getting delivered from that. How was that deliverance undertaken. In Israel, they were taken through the Red Sea. And in the scripture we read there, the, in the early days, the, the, the early church understood that this was a picture of salvation because they said these people were baptized into Moses. Our baptism is, a, is, is pictured in this deliverance of the people of Israel from Egypt. They went through the water that's why full immersion baptism is a, f a much better picture of what's going on because you're going into the water just like the people went into the Red Sea and up and out again. And the important thing is, where is the power of sin? Where is the power of Pharaoh in the Red Sea? We sang it, didn't we, this morning? In the Red Sea, under the water, drowned. And I love Moses' song. I mean, it really labors it on. They sank like lead. <laughs> they went down in the water. They, they were drowned. The, the important thing is the power of Pharaoh was completely destroyed. The power of sin, when through baptism, is completely destroyed. It has no power and authority over us unless we give it some. <laughs> okay. Okay, can we have the next slide, please? And this is Paul writing in, in Romans. Says, Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. You've been baptized, you're in new life. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that sin would no longer be, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from 
sin. Yeah. We are no longer slaves to sin. Amen? Amen. It is good news. This is the gospel. It's good news. People can be freed from being enslaved to sin and sinful lifestyles and habits and the things that destroy them. People can be freed from them as we have been. And we can live freer if we understand this. Amen. Okay, next slide, please. And just to emphasize it again, this is in, in Colossians. Giving thanks to the Father who's qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Now, where in that is it talking about it's all going to happen when we go to heaven? This is something for the future. No, it's happened. He has transferred us. It's done, <laughs> whether you're conscious of it or not, and it's much better to be conscious of it, you have been transferred into the kingdom of light. And baptism proclaims and empowers that transfer, transformation of people who are no longer sinners but holy, with a new, born-again nature, one that is not in its DNA powerless against sin. Our DNA is that we are conquerors of sin. So as a Christian, you're not a sinner. You're chosen. You're holy and beloved. So sin for a Christian is unnatural. It's against your new nature. But it, as we said, it happens, and that can get sorted out. Not a problem. Slide 11, please. Thanks. So to identify myself as a sinner is to set a low bar of expectation in terms of my lifestyle and my choices. To identify myself as chosen, holy, and beloved, that sets a true level of expectation of relationship with God and a life lived pleasing to him. Amen? Amen. Okay, third word. Beloved. It's an interesting word, not often used. But in the Bible, it comes up a lot, and particularly in the Song of Psalms. There's over 30 references, and it's in the relationship. In relationship. Not just someone who's loved, but beloved. And beloved has the sense to it, so I'm told by those who understand language, and I've looked it up. It's a love that's intense and specific. Now, we all say God loves the world, yes, and God loves everybody. That's quite general, and being general, we can feel it may, it doesn't particularly apply. But no, he tells us that we are beloved. He's focused. Where do we he say beloved? This is my beloved son. He talks about his son in that way. He talks about you in that way. You're specifically and intensely loved by God. We are beloved. Have the next slide, please. Okay, so this is the Colossians verse again. Those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on. Because we've been set free, we've got a choice now. We've got a choice to put off the old and put on the new. So put on, choose to put on compassion, choose to put on kindness, choose to put on humility, gentleness, and patience. And it'll be natural for you because that's your DNA. As I said, to be sinful is unnatural, which is why it hurts us so much. We're free from sin, free to choose to do what is right. Just like the Israelites were then free from, from Egypt because Pharaoh's power was destroyed in the Red Sea. But they took a lot of Egypt with them in their thinking and in their hearts. And they actually lived Egyptian star worshipping strange gods and doing stuff and longing to be back for Egypt. And we can do that as Christians. Although physically and, and, and spiritually we have been moved from one kingdom to another, our thinking and our lifestyle can still be back in the old way. 
and that needs working on. It's way, we've been transferred, but we're being transformed. Something dramatic and spiritual has happened. Bring move us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Now we've got to live according to the new kingdom that we're in. And that can take some work. And that's what the church is for. And that's what one another's for. That's what discipleship is for, is to bring us about that transformation. The fantastic thing is, though, that we've got that freedom. Christ has set us free. Amen. Amen. sing again but changing the word I'm no longer a slave to sin